having looked at that, having looked at uh, uh, West's clip, we're going to uh, now move on to um, uh, our last two thinkers. And uh, the, fir the first one is uh, Bruno Latour. And you're reading a small section of this really important uh, historian and philosopher of science, Bruno Latour. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I offer it to you uh, uh, because of uh, uh, this following theme. It, he wants to move cultural criticism, postmodern cultural criticism, away from deconstruction, away from critique uh, only, and towards constructivism, towards the making of things, um, rather than the uh, tearing things apart. Now, he, he tells the story, Latour does in his piece, uh, of, of how um, his own uh, work in the philosophy and history of science um, has come back to haunt him. Uh, that is, he and many people in science studies were really good at showing that science wasn't this pure, uh, uh, objective practice that had a, uh, a firm foundation, that science was uh, also riddled with ideology, with politics, with, um, um, uh, with uh, a kind of messy uh, being in the worldness. Um, and uh, Latour and, and many people in science studies showed that. But now, Latour says, when they're trying to argue about climate change and other things that depend on scientific facts, his, the conservative forces, the forces that want to keep um, the, 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 the th way th things the way they are, say, oh yeah, well, your science, that we all know science isn't all that important. We all know that uh, scientists make up stuff. We all know that they're political. And so Latour is struck by the fact that the um, um, uh, conspiracy theorists and what he thinks of as the kind of uh, know-nothing right wing are now using the postmodern critique of science against attempts to change the world uh, with, uh, uh, by appealing to facts. And, um, uh, uh, and so he, he's, he's, he's taken aback by really the kind of postmodern racism, as Zizek talked about that too, postmodern rejection of science and post the so-called foundationless attempts to keep the world um, the way it is. And so Latour um, uh, uh, says we on the left, we cultural critics need to move away from just uh, matters of facts um, to we need to articulate why we have matters of concern, that is why certain things demand our care and cultivation and not just our observation. The whole of science is about one man being right even when 10,000 are wrong. I mean, and Galileo comes in five minutes later. So that's where, again, and this is back to the argument about the techniques and the digital technique especially. Is there a metric which allows us, us being the poor guys, scientists or not scientists, engaged into the question of composition. The one about this island of a physicist engaged in climatology and modeling. Is there a way to count again the authorities? Because that's the way in which the, so that's a very important issue where, I mean, there are lots of science, science, science students working on that, and it's very interesting. It's interesting for the digital tools, it's interesting for the scientometry, bibliometry, and so on, and journalism, of course, which is to learn how to weigh these authorities in, in a new way. Now, of course, a practicing physicist will do that by looking at the argument, uh, asking his colleagues, um, this, this is something odd there. I mean, there are lots of, there's a built-in, very complex instrument of, of tasting an argument. I mean, a good scientist is always the one who has this way to taste. So there is a quantifying element there. In a good scientist knowing that this is, that this weight, weighing, is very difficult to transport in the public arena. Because it's immensely difficult, as, as, as it, and it's very rarely described. Because the philosophy of science is not supposed to be, I mean, even a physicist, you say you're rational, which means you have a good nose. But it's not the same thing as being rational. 
or being rational is having a good nose. And how do you describe it? It's like describing my father's wine tasting abilities. I mean, it's a very difficult instrument. I think there is an exhibition here at the gallery, science gallery, on that, <laughs> which I, I will see on Monday. Uh, and that's where I think the, the, the work, this is where the, the common work between people coming from the science, from the political science, from the digital world uh, should collaborate because it's a very tricky uh, issue. What is the weighing of authority when the question is no longer, I'm a scientist, thus I have the authority, it doesn't work anymore, scientists are not believed like in this little anecdote, or they are, they are interrogated as people of belief, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, Rick Perry, who is a, a governor of Texas, accused the climatologist of doing all the climatology for money. The guy is entirely paid by the lobby of, 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 of oil. So how do you resist that? S some of my friends are in climatology in France are that they are depressed, they are deeply depressed, because they cannot use anymore the argument, we are doing the science, these guys are just agitators. The point that these guys are saying we are the scientists, and you are the lobbyist, because you do that for money, for grant money. So suddenly you realize that the epistemological argument don't have any weight anymore. What are the tools which makes possible for them again to have with. And that's where you cannot stop any argument by saying I'm a rational person and you are the irrational person. I mean, even though we do that in business, of course, I mean, as an administrator we do that, but we know it. It doesn't work for me at all. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, we have to build a commonwealth. But we cannot build it with the argument of rationality anymore. That's where the change is so deep. And so it's so interesting. So, so let me uh, uh, give you this quotation from Latour, who in his, is talking about uh, matters of concern and in relation to facts. Uh, the question was never to get away from the facts, but closer to them, Latour writes. Not fighting empiricism, but on the contrary, renewing empiricism. What I am going to argue is that the critical mind, if it is to renew itself and be relevant again, is to be found in the cultivation of a stubbornly realist attitude. To speak like William James, Latour writes, uh, but a realism dealing with what I call matters of concern and uh, not matters of fact. And he goes on to talk about how the Enlightenment has devoured itself, how critical thinking through, uh, as debunking uh, has devoured itself, and that we have to go beyond this uh, um, self-devouring, <laughs> if I could put it that way, um, and uh, to, to something else. Uh, because, and, and this is, remember Horkheimer and Adorno said much the same thing. They said that Horkheimer and Adorno in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, the introduction to which we read, right, they said that um, uh, the Enlightenment was a kind of myth busting. You know, the Enlightenment was always showing that um, uh, this was uh, not true, it was a myth. This was false, it was a myth. This was a, a, a pretended to be science, but it was a myth. But in fact, um, Enlightenment debunking so much became a myth of debunking itself. That is, enlightenment became this thing that had no outside. It was the only enterprise that seemed to count. And Latour is saying, the critical thinking as debunking is making us powerless because it takes away our possibilities for engaging with the things we care about because this notion of things we care about uh, um, would be debunked. <laughs> and, 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 he, and, and that, he thinks, um, is the... Uh, 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 the self-destruction of critical uh, theory. So what he asks for is to go from deconstruction to constructivism. From deconstruction to constructivism. Can we devise, he writes, another powerful descriptive tool that details, uh, that deals this time with matters of concern and whose import then will no longer be to debunk but to protect and to care. That's the key here, the switch from debunk debunking or deconstruction to protection and, to ca and care. And he's citing here a great uh, uh, contemporary thinker, Donna Haraway, who is also now writing a, a lot about th these objects of care. Is it really possible 
to transform the critical urge, Latour writes, in the ethos of someone who adds reality to matters of fact and not subtract reality. Notice that the critic now is supposed to not just to show you how silly things are or how uh, perverse or twisted they are, but to add to reality, to put it another way, to move from deconstruction uh, uh, to constructivism or uh, um, uh, what's the, to, to note the difference between those two things. So the critic uh, should be, Latour concludes, one who uh, uh, assembles, one who assembles and doesn't just uh, uh, debunk. To quote him again one last time, the critic is not the one who lifts the rugs from under the feet of the naive believers in the Voltairean Enlightenment sense, but the one who offers participants arenas in which to gather. In other words, a place where people can construct a new language game, a place where people can make um, a, a new vocabulary, and not just a place where they can show that other vocabularies don't work so well. Um, and, and so for Latour, he wants the contemporary critical theorist, the postmodern critical theorist, uh, who's given up on the really real to um, actually find a way to gather together to uh, express what they care about without uh, foundations, what they need to protect, uh, uh, even though that protection doesn't have some ultimate um, uh, foundation. We end our course with um, uh, a contemporary thinker also sexually associated with Princeton, that's Anthony Appia, who's a philosopher there, uh, and we're looking at a fairly recent work of his uh, called Cosmopolitanism, and I, I'd, I'd like you to look at this clip from, from this uh, uh, documentary that uh, uh, is available uh, uh, through the link here, uh, where he talks about contemporary hybridity. Cosmopolitanism comes from the Greek phrase cosmopolitas, which means citizen of the cosmos, of the world. And uh, we need a notion of global citizenship. The cosmopolitan says you have to begin by recognizing that we're responsible collectively for each other, as citizens are. But second, Cosmopolitans think that it's okay for people to, to, to be different, that they, that they care about everybody, but not in a way that means they want everybody to be the same or like them. Uh, whereas there's a certain kind of uh, philosophical universalism, which is often associated with evangelizing religions, uh, where, yeah, we love everybody, but we want them to become like us in order to love them properly. Um, there's a great uh, German uh, proverb which says, Und willst du nicht mein Bruder sein, so schlage ich dir den Schädel ein. If you don't want to be my brother, I'll bash your skull in. And that's, a, that's, that's the opposite of cosmopolitanism. It's, it's the university that says, yeah, I want you to be my brother, but on my terms. Now, if you think that everybody's entitled to be different, right, it can produce a kind of cultural relativism in which you say, Whatever they want to do, that's fine, but, you know, there's no place for me standing outside to make any moral judgments, any ethical judgments about what they're up to. So that's kind of one position that I want to distinguish myself from. I think that it's very important that in the global conversation of human beings that cosmopolitans recommend, one of the things we're doing is exchanging ideas about what's right and wrong, and that it's perfectly appropriate to do so. Now, you see that for Appiah, uh, um, the contemporary world is not a, a world in which we should have a philosophical search for purity or identity or foundations, but it, it's a world that should um, s explore the link between cosmopolitanism and freedom. Here's what he says. Cosmopolitans think human variety matters because people are entitled to the options they need to shape their lives in partnerships with others. Notice that they are entitled, uh, he doesn't say by what exactly, uh, uh, to the options they need to shape their lives in partnerships with others. What he wants to explore here um, and argue for is that the, the, in the space through which people create new communities, new connections, not where they drill down to find purer connections. That, that the, the liberating part, the progressive part, the freeing part, uh, is the part that allows us to um, expand our um, multiplicity, our horizons of diversity, uh, to expand our cosmopolitanism. 
He says, if we want to preserve a wide range of human conditions because it allows free people the best chance to make their own lives, there is no place for the enforcement of diversity by trapping people into a kind of difference uh, they long to escape. In other words, he is arguing against a kind of multiculturalism that says we have to ground uh, each person's identity in some specific ethnic tradition that they have to be beholden to. Instead, um, he looks towards a, what you could call it a happy globalism, in which people can retain some connection to multiple traditions, but aren't imprisoned by uh, the essential nature of any particular tradition. Um, they can assemble traditions. They can manufacture, if you will, invent, perhaps a better word, um, contemporary traditions on the basis um, of a multiplicity of uh, possibilities. So some identities are, as philosophers would say, determinants of a determinable. So some are like race. Uh, in principle, uh, you know, the, the racial system is laid out so that you have to be of either of mixed race or of one of the races, and you can't be, as it were, black and, and Asian at the same time. You can be mixed race, but you can't be straightforwardly Asian and straightforwardly black at the same time. Uh, so in that sense, that mutual exclusivity is built into the structure of some kinds of identity. But there's nothing in general about identities that excludes the overlap of different forms of identity, of gender and race and sexual orientation and religion and nationality and class, all in a single person. And indeed, most people have all of these things. Um, why? Well, what's a sensible thought about how to deal with them? Well, first of all, uh, and this relates to what the proper answer to the question in uh, what's your identity is, uh, usually in a context, it's pretty clear which aspects of your identity are the ones that are relevant. If I'm at a meeting of the American Philosophical Association, um, my, my identity as a philosopher is kind of important. But if I go to a meeting uh, of, a, of a, uh, you know, a, a church group, it probably isn't. And so I know, uh, I know without thinking about it, uh, often, what the relevance is of different dimensions of my identity. So when people are get into trouble with this, it's because they think that one dimension of identity makes a demand on them that's inconsistent with the demand made by some other dimension of their identity. Our responsibilities aren't just to 100 people whom we can interact with and see, and that's, I think, the great challenge. And cosmopolitanism, for me, is meant to be an answer to that challenge. It's meant to say, you can't retreat to the 100. You can't simply be partial to some tiny group and simply live out your moral life in that. That's not, that's not morally permissible. But you can't abandon your local group either, because that, that would take you too far away, I think, from your humanity. So what we have to do is to learn how to do both. The threatening uh, uh, forms of identity uh, um, erasure that some people have seen in globalization Apia wants to combat by giving people freedom to embrace different traditions rather than trying to protect any one tradition's purity. And that it really brings us towards the end of our class because uh, that, that notion of multiplicity, of diversity, of figuring out a way to expand horizons without foundations um, is um, uh, 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 the pragmatic approach to, uh, to the a postmodern condition. It's no longer worrying about or even celebrating the end of foundationalism. Uh, it no longer seeks a really real, it no longer even seeks the, the Rousseauian form of honesty and authenticity, but instead celebrates a creative possibility of remaking identity and politics and uh, cultural practices on the basis of heterogeneity. Um, uh, now, you might ask, why is heterogeneity privileged? Why is heterogeneity, is it a new uh, foundation? Uh, and I think the answer from Appiah or Latour or uh, Rorty uh, uh, or, or West would be no, heterogeneity is not a new foundation. It is the condition of our contemporary language games. It is the condition of how uh, we interact with one another and we don't need a foundation for it, but we can mine that condition for its 
uh, for the traditions that help best help us cope uh, with reality, that best help us promote new inquiry, that best help us um, pursue the things um, we think we want. You know, so you, to the question, how do you know what you really want? How do you know what you really should want? Uh, are these contemporary pragmatists would say, there's no f clear answer to that. The only way of answering that question um, is through further conversation, uh, further interaction, uh, uh, more communal practices rather than some uh, pretended um, uh, objective search for an ultimate foundation. So we have gone from uh, the early stages of this class where enlightenment was uh, myth busting and, uh, or, or uh, critique of the enlightenment in Rousseau where um, uh, uh, the, the worry that enlightenment left behind your uh, essential authentic identity to uh, a pragmatic um, uh, emphasis on the endless nature of inquiry the endless possibilities of hybridity, and a hopeful attitude about how um, without foundations we might find through more democratic and open-ended practices uh, better ways of coping with the challenges of the contemporary world. I hope that through the reading of this course and through the conversations you've had uh, online with uh, other members of the class uh, about our readings, that you too have found an expansion of horizons, uh, uh, not some new foundation, but perhaps some new authors that you now love, whether that's Virginia Woolf or Baudelaire or Foucault or uh, Flaubert or whoever it might be, um, uh, that you found uh, in the readings for this class new ways of thinking, not about what's really real, but about what might be possible for you. Uh, if that happened, I think the class is successful, and I thank you for uh, being part of it, and uh, I look forward to uh, further interactions uh, through Coursera or in other ways. Thanks very much.